my skin in one night went into complete meltdown. It was like a wildfire. You can't control it. It takes over your life. It was just absolutely bewildering. Meet Sarah Brown, founder of Pi Skincare and pioneer of sensitive skincare that is ethical, organic, and sustainable. She's here to tell you how her own struggles with extremely fragile and sensitive skin led her to build a business that is a force for good, no matter what it took. Pi is one of those classic businesses that was born out of a problem and born out of a garage as well. Why can't it be beautiful and an indulgence every day? So that's our kind of niche, which is not niche at all. It's all about the diligence of how you create products. That's where the magic happens for us because we do it ourselves. Basically, I started the business and ran out of money within three months. It's commercial insanity. We poured everything into this and we might lose it. The most important question of all, <laughs> <laughs> what is your skincare routine? Sarah, welcome to Anatomy of a Leader. Thank you for having me, Maria. So good. It's great to be here. Yeah, so good to have you on the show. You're the founder of Pi Skincare, and I'd love to hear how it all started. Why did you start the company? Well, how long have you got? Okay. So, um... In less than four <laughs> minutes. Yeah, but I'll try and sort of compound 16 years into, into a few minutes. But yeah, Pi is one of those classic businesses that was born out of a problem and born out of a garage as well. Um, but the problem was my skin. So I had never been in beauty before. I worked in the wine industry, so completely different. But my skin in one night went into complete meltdown. And I was in my kind of mid twenties at the time. I had a good job, a big job, a busy life. And it, it changed my life in one night. So I, I woke up in the night itching. I had hives, you know, raised wheels over 80% of my body. The more I itched, the more it spread. It was like a wildfire and it was just an extraordinary thing. And I thought, oh my God, what, what's happened? To, is this an anaphylactic reaction? Have I eaten something? Um, but also it was so odd because it was so hot to the touch. So it's, it's sort of freakishly hot. And so I had to get into a cold bath and just go, what's happening? And I, I went to my GP, I got referred to Charing Cross Hospital. I was in and out of clinics there. They did a load of tests and they said, yeah, you've got this condition called chronic urticaria. It's so common, Maria, but people just doesn't get the airtime of eczema. And every time I talk about urticaria, and it will, it will happen again now, um, people always get in touch to say, finally, someone's giving this, is, is talking about this condition, but it's a very odd one. It's very erratic. You can't control it. It takes over your life. It made me feel so unconfident and very self-conscious. And yeah, it affects your relationships. When your skin goes wrong, and in it, and obviously in mine was an extreme way. Um, it yeah, it can affect your relationship. It can affect your work. And so anyway, this was where I was, mm. and I just couldn't get the the help I needed really because. Urticaria, like many skin conditions, actually is idiopathic. So it means of unknown cause, um, and that means they don't know anything. So I was sent on my way out of Charing Cross Hospital saying, here, here are some sort of drugs you can take when you're in the moment of a flare-up, but it's not going to treat it. It's just it was going to relieve the symptoms but and just take them for the rest of your life. And I said, anything else? They were like, no, no. And I said, but it seems worse, you know, before my menstrual cycle, it's worse when I wear, eat certain foods. They're like, no, none of that's relevant. And of course it was all relevant, but I was told it wasn't. So I didn't really take steps myself to do anything about it. So I lived with it for so long. And then my issue with urticaria is that, and usually when it onsets, and you know, for me it was in one night, suddenly I, everything was turned upside down. So I couldn't use any skincare any makeup have and I had a full collection mm -hmm. uh perfume mm -hmm. so I and every time I put something in my face that I might have used for years I would puff so I had to sort of and start again and so I was plunged into the world of beauty and you know pharmacies and trying to find solutions and it was just absolutely bewildering because I was I didn't know how to read an ingredients list. I didn't know what was going to work for me. I didn't know if natural was better. I didn't know what hypoallergenic meant. It means nothing. <laughs> uh, it's just a made up term. Uh, 
And so you, I just spent years just navigating this abyss and with no help. And what I found is as I started to take a bit more kind of personal responsibility and wanting to find solutions because it was so bad, um, I started to unpick ingredient lists and I started to research what they are and started to diarize my life. And that was the life-changing moment. So I, I would say anyone going, whatever your skin, if you're in that kind of rut, just start writing stuff down. It makes you feel much better and you're doing something positive. And I would start to see patterns occur. So um, yeah, I just was plunged into this world and it was a very dark place actually for me. But then light came because I started to find little nuggets of truth. How long did you keep the diary for? Um, so I, I will say I, I tried and failed many times. So it was aborted often because it's actually very hard. If you do it properly, it's actually very hard to do because you should be documenting sleep, everything you're eating, um, your cycle, days you're feeling stressed, days you'll run down. You should document everything. But I would say two months is, if you can do two months, that's, that's good. You can do three, even better and you will start to see patterns emerge. And it's what we always say to people who come to us, just take this time to do it. And again, I think it's just a good moment of reflection because often you will see that you're flaring at the similar time in the month and it will be related to your hormones, you know, even though you're told it might not be related. So trust your instincts too. So I, I had to sort of do all this. And then, as I say, it just, it was, I always say this business found me um, and then my partner joined the business um, soon after I started it. And it's been the most amazing partnership, actually. So I always say, he's he, I'm always the front and center of the brand, but he's the one building the stage that he's putting me on. Um, but um, I had to find these moments of sort of clarity on what was causing my 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 challenges, and and then tried to look at you know all of the ingredient lists, and I found common ingredients that I was like, actually, I think. Maybe I should eliminate this. And I'm not going to lie, Maria, it was absolutely painstaking process. But my God, if you can start to take more informed decisions, everything unlocks. Um, and that was it, really. And I started to think, oh my gosh, okay, I now know what the ingredients I need to avoid. I now need know the foods I need to avoid and all of those things. And then try to navigate them, you know, the pharmacy aisles for it. And what I found was that... Um, my options were close to zero and where there were options they didn't work and i you know it's really interesting because i've been doing this a long time and it was bad then and it's it's there's, there's obviously a, the natural category of beauty has opened up a lot and the kind of clean movement's huge and yet people like me are still really underserved and i'll tell you why because and it, if you Everybody said, go to the pharmacy and buy a classic mineral-based, petroleum-based aqueous cream. That's like your default. And those products make you really depressed. <laughs> Every day, they sit on your bathroom cabinet, you know, your bathroom shelf, and you go, and it, it reminds you every day you've got a problem. And so also... It's not, a, it's not a biological thing. It's, it's both. It's for me. Like, they didn't work for me anyway, because mm -hmm. they they haven't got their own fragrance and their... They're just very basic cake cream, but they didn't, they didn't work for me either. So it was like double hits of, they don't work for me. They're, they're cheap, they're synthetic. They're not a pleasant experience. They're not a self-care experience. They're not pampering. And um, so they don't work, but also they're just really depressing to have. And, and also when you see all of this other glossy stuff out there, you're like, well, I want that. Mm. And then as I got older, I was like, I want that and I want the performance and I want the actives as well because you know, this isn't getting any younger. And there was, you can't, you can't sort of have it. And I see it all the time. We did a pop-up recently and I spent, I mean, literally 16 hours talking to customers. I love it. Um, but it just reinforced all these years later that the problem hasn't changed, despite there being thousands of brands out there and millions of products. <clears throat> We're still not serving this customer who wants to not compromise. They want to have a beautiful product that's not cheap and nasty and, and ugly and doesn't work. They want a lovely product in glass. And, you know, for us, when we, we worked on our rebrand, it was always my vision was about, you know, let's put every single product should be a little piece of art in their bathroom. Why, why not? 
just because we're targeting a more sensitive customer. Sensitive takes a million forms anyway, but why can't it be beautiful and like an experience and an indulgence every day and be an absolute joy to use? So it was, and then it was about textures and then it was like, actually, sometimes you, there is a place for aroma and you can have it. And then we got into the kind of the, the high performance skincare space of, you know, you can use vitamin C and yes, you can use peptides and actually you should use peptides. And yes, there are natural peptides. And yes, you can use a retinoid now. And yes, it can be natural. And all of these things were just blocked. If you were that customer, you were really fearful of using them. And the moments that you did go, oh, I'm so enticed. I really want to play there. They would have bad experiences and react. So that's our kind of niche, which is not niche at all. Like it's a huge market of very underserved customers who want the joy of beauty and the joy of skincare, but without the compromise. And sort of layered into that was also the values in the business, which we can, you know, mm. we can go into, but um, that's the sort of icing on the cake, mm. I think. When did you start tracking? So how long ago was that? Your, your, what was impacting you? So you talked about tracking sleep, tracking what you're eating. Or, yeah. You know, I mean, this, this is five years ago. I mean, this is, I was sort of by then. So I lived with my condition um, pretty miserably for about three years mm -hmm. and actually with urta care it's a weird thing like derms would say to me dermatologists would say yeah we don't really understand it and sometimes it just has a two-year cycle and it will just come really suddenly and then just go really suddenly and years and years later i've talked to dermatologists and they're like you were told that <laughs> and i was like do you think they were trying to just get me to go away <laughs> <laughs> and actually I've no, I, I don't think I've met anyone with urticaria care where that's actually happened. But so I waited and I was like, oh, I'll just live with it and it will go. And then it just got worse. And and I think it was related to the fact I was working in the States then. I had a big job there. And, and we loved doing? it. I was working in the wine industry uh, in California. It was a great job. Mm. Um, it was a big job. And I did, I really did love it. And actually, I think it, it again gave me a little bit of the, 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 I'd always, I think, wanted to run my own business. I think, you know, I was the weird kid selling stuff in the playground. So we said, I was selling crosswords that I'd done myself. And I used to send my dad, I used to do them and say to my dad, could you, could you photocopy them at work? <laughs> and so he'd come back and I'd say, I need 50 copies, right? And he thought it was, each time he thought it was a school project or something and I would make them into books and sell them. And my mum got, I know this is a massive digression, but my mum, uh, got a call from one of the mums saying, do you realise that all of my child's pocket money is going to Sarah? <laughs> and, uh, and I was asked, and my mum got me to stop. And she said, you know, and I said, but it's a quality product. Yeah. I couldn't understand it. I was like, it's a quality product. It's very valuable. So it's very valuable. And anyway, so I was told not to do it anymore. But I, was, I, don't, I honestly don't know how old I was, young, young. Mm -hmm. So I think I've always had it in me, but that actually that job spirit. that job in in california i was in a huge family business it's one of the biggest wine brands and families in the world a huge business but seeing and but still seeing 13 family members working in the business was really interesting and um just seeing a hot, and i worked a lot on the more agency and creative agency media agency and pr agency side so you never n n didn't always have the visibility of what the, the inner workings of a business. And I think that was the first business where I was like, okay, so that's supply chain, and that's operations. And just seeing how this business had grown, uh, I think probably planted a seed a bit. This episode is sponsored by HVO Search, a specialist executive search and talent advisory firm helping founders, CEOs, and HR directors hire the most in-demand, and best C-suite talent. Tired of seeing the same old CVs and uninspiring candidates? Reach out to me, Maria Vorostovsky, to find out how your business can skyrocket with the best talent. You're talking, about, talking about what you were tracking. Oh yeah, so I was tracking, yeah. So I, I was in, at that time I was in California and I remember there was a moment where I was in a meeting and it was a big meeting and, and wine then was slightly more male dominated and. Um, and I remember going into a kind of boardroom and it was all guys and it was a big, it was an important meeting. And I was like, and I could just, with Eta Kerry, you just know, you can feel the telltale kind of prickle and you're like, oh God. And I just knew that I was starting to flare. 
And that was stress related. That's stress related. I wasn't feeling really stressed in the meeting, but it was just the pressure. And and I remember going like this with my hair. And urticaria is so weird. Like you would you can have raised wheels that are you know half a centimeter high and i just had three perpendicular lines coming out wow. of my forehead and they were all just going and being very american they were like what's up <laughs> what's up with your forehead and you know and i was like mm. and that, you know now i would just laugh and go but then i just wanted the world to literally open up and swallow me up and it and it was that moment actually if i can roll it back to one moment it was then that i went I can't, I, I need to understand this better. I can't live like this and I've got to take action. And I wasn't, I couldn't get the help anywhere else. So that's when I started to go, I need to write stuff down. So what patterns did you notice? So one thing you said is stress. Yes. What else? Um, sleep is a big one. Um, and sleep's a really interesting one because what, um, what happens when we go to sleep is that a lot of our organs go into rest phase. One of the organs that doesn't is skin. And skin is our, actually our biggest organ. And we don't think of it as an organ, but it's a very important one. And actually when we go into sleep, it's the one organ that goes kind of berserk and goes into really strong repair kind of mode. Um, and so if you're not, it, that's really important for skin. skin. And if you're not sleeping um, because of stress, or anxiety, or because you're itching, because urticaria often is worse at night, you're impairing that process, um, and it sort of becomes a catch-22. So stress we see all the time is really, really important, and you see it in particularly conditions like eczema and psoriasis, di directly linked to your to your um, emotional well-being, and there's lots of physiological reasons for that. Um, so stress was one. Um, for me, diet. So weird things like, I mean, I worked in the wine industry and I was doing wine tastings all of the time with journalists mm. and wine was not good for me. I was like, geez, I'm allergic to my job. Uh, what would happen? So if you were wine tasting, what would happen and how quickly? It would depend. I mean, it depends, but it's quite quick. So I would say from eating 20 minutes. Oh, right. 30 so minutes. Fast. Yeah, it's mm. pretty quick. I mean, it sort of depends. Um, but wine for me was not good. I mean, I still love wine. <laughs> I'm not giving it up. And but the, this is quite an important point because I think it's about being informed and knowledge is power and all of that, that actually I won't go without the, the foods and wine and things I love, but I'll just do it in moderation or I will just know that I'm going to be a bit itchy tonight. And actually the difference between not understanding that, not knowing that and knowing that is huge. And actually your reaction often is bigger if you just not understand it, because you can reconcile it and you can say, okay, I'm just- It's a sense of control, it's this, it? It is all about control. We see it all the time in the skin. It's pushing you, as soon as we put, and we, you know, we do free consultations for people. And it's always, that's always been a core tenet of what we do. And it's one I feel so strongly about, but often it is just about listening and then giving people a few things to start and do. And it is about helping them feel like they're in the driving seat and it's very, very powerful. Mm -hmm. So, um, so yes, yeah, so sleep for me was one, uh, stress, um, diet, certain foods. So wine we were talking about was not great, but actually weirdly, I was like looking at different types of wine. So I got quite granular. <laughs> so I found that old world wine was better for me than new world. Stuff like this. Is it to do with what's in it? Yeah, to, I think, I guess, and it's probably use of sulfites, I guess, um, things like that. So there's a lot of histamine in wine and actually urticaria is very linked to histamine releasing the skin. So it's not out there that it would affect you. Um, what else? Things like tomatoes were better if they were cooked for me than raw. You know, just it's like these little nuggets you get and together it kind of amounts to something bigger. Mm -hmm. Um, so yes, yeah, so it was that, and then skincare was was a big one because I couldn't use anything, and that was a real loss in my life of just not being able to use makeup and um, and not sort of understanding why. And then I started to see certain ingredients that were problematic for me, and it could be anything from alcohol in products through to a lot of the preservatives are quite tricky. So mm -hmm. you need preservatives in skincare, 
you shouldn't be using preservative free skincare, but there are the ones that are kinder on skin. So which one did you discover that was the worst for your skin? Um, there's a really well-known, it's absolutely impossible to pronounce. It's called methiazoline or something like that, but I just call it MI. So if you Google MI, it'll come up. And actually at one point, I mean, I'd known it for a long time because it is very sensitizing and there's now a ban on it. I think you can only use it in wash off formulas now, not in anything that stays on. And I think you're quite restricted in what you can use, but for years it was a big preservative in skincare. And actually the dermatology com community actually said, we think there's an epidemic of eczema from this ingredient. So that's a, that's a big one. There's another one called phenoxyethanol, which is one that I was particularly sensitive to. Um, fragrance certain fragrance but more artificial fragrance for me certain essential oils i could use the citrus ones are worse it, it like there's there's different different ingredients but like you know that's a whole podcast on its own no i'm <laughs> sure i mean to go through all of the ingredients yeah. well, let's just keep it simple like yeah, what yeah. are the most common ingredients in skincare that are the most sensitizing or really not good for you or for your skin at all it's a great question. So I would say three, there's three kind of categories. So I would say what we call the surfactants. So that's anything that's a detergent. So anything that foams. So generally speaking, they will strip your skin. Um, they will spike your pH of your skin because they're very alkaline, but they'll strip your natural oil. And what happens, whatever your skin type is going to create lots of imbalance. So not great and particularly not great for certain things like eczema so so foaming agents not good alcohol is the big one and there's different types of alcohol in in cosmetic chemistry so without getting too technical some are actually fatty alcohols which are emulsifying agents so they bind formulas together and they're fine it's the straight alcohol the alcohol and it's called often denat alcohol denat on the ingredient list it means denatured alcohol and that's the one that if you have rosacea, you cannot be near. Um, so alcohol, you don't really want in a formula anyway. Um, you see it a lot in things like mists and tonics. Um, anything with really high water content often will have alcohol in it. So is that to help it to evaporate faster? It's just to keep it actually, um, it's often to keep it stable um, and, and kind of bacteria free. So it's, it's, it's not just that. Um, it will, it's, it can be quite astringent. Um, some people put alcohol into after sun formulas to give that cooling sensation. Mm. You, the, the last thing you want to put on skin that's had sun exposure and is maybe burned is alcohol. Is that still being done? I think so. I think, uh, yeah, actually oh. our formulator was mm. talking to me about that and I was like, oh my God. So alcohol, so foaming agents, alcohol, and then preservatives is a tricky space. Um, I think you kind of have to do your own research on that, but there are um, the ones I've talked about. You need preservatives. There are some that are better than others. And it's. I think that can be quite, I think that can d depend on the person. So things like the, the kind of benzyl alcohols and sodium benzoates can be quite sensitizing for certain people. And we found it in masks and leave on products that you might leave on for 10 minutes before you wash off in a very concentrated way can be quite difficult. Mm -hmm. And then fragrance, and I think actually fragrance is an interesting one because it's the one often people land on first. So if you have sensitive skin, you will say, I can't, I ha it has to be fragrance free. It's not always the case. So generally speaking, it's better to avoid fragrance compounds, but there are some that you can use. Um, and if you are wanting some aroma in a product, it's they're better in creams than things like oils because oils need a lot more essential oils, for example, in it to stay. Um, whereas creams you only need a tiny amount. Um, so it's very, very, very diluted. So they can be okay. So you're saying creams are better than oils? I think if you want a fragrance, if you want a product that and you, you want maybe some fragrance in it and essential oils, you know, can play their part in that versus artificial fragrance. Um, if you're formulating a product, a cream requires less, less aroma or less essential oil quantity in it than something like an oil you tend to need a lot more for it to stick and stay over time mm -hmm. um so and they're the big ones i would say and in your products in yeah. skincare do you use fragrance sometimes so i would say about 50 to 60 percent of our products are now are fragrance free so there's usually a choice if you don't want fragrance 
um, and we work at where there's kind of categories of product where we don't have a fragrance free option, there will be one very soon. Um, but we do, and some in some cases they play a part. So, for example, if you look at um, our exfoliator, it's a wash off formula. Uh, it is a physical exfoliator. It's the product I always say that got me through two newborns, <laughs> because you know, I mean, you know, as a mum, but there's there's that time where you're so sleep deprived you don't even know your own name. Uh, you certainly can't remember the name of your children, and uh, and that was the product that would kind of keep me sane because it was just this lovely kind of cleansing but very gentle polish formula. But that's a wash of formula, but it has a little bit of Mei Chang in it. It's one of my favorite essential oils. It's, it's, there's minuscule amount, minuscule amounts, but it's a very uplifting aroma, and it just it it just lifts you, and it's part of the experience, mm -hmm. and and it has its place, and it's not going to sensitize because it's washed away. And I, it, the important thing to say, you know, with pie is that every single product we put through rigorous independent patch testing so are they clinically proven for sensitive skin even the products with fragrance are so clinically proven that we can confidently say it's fine for a more sensitive skin and you don't have to do that test it's not required but we do it and they're usually done on just normal skin and we do it only on sensitive skin and it's normally a 24 hour test and we do a 96 hour test so we're just going each step so that we can really confidently say we've really thoughtfully created this product and if there is a rumor that it's usually there for a really really good reason and it's part of the product experience and we're confident it won't sensitize so it's i think it's all about the diligence of how you create products and i think that's where that's where the magic happens for us because we do it ourselves and it's a really sad fact that 99 0.9% of the beauty and personal care products you buy are made by the same people. They're made by the same factories. They're often formulated by the same people. You know, we're talking about a handful of suppliers and that's where how the market has shifted because it's so bloody expensive and impossible to do yourself as you scale a business. And very early on, you know, literally started making products in a garage in Ealing Broadway with no money and right? totally bootstrapped for the longest time. But but that creation process was amazing. And then as we grew, we were going actually there's real benefits to having that control over your own manufacturing and being able to almost we were always producing to demand. And then obviously we're much bigger now. We have a huge factory in, in West London still, but um you can you can do that due diligence on your products and your formulas and your ingredients and you know where your ingredients are coming from you have absolute control you know also that the ingredient that you've sourced needs to be stored a certain way and never overheated and you know you know it you know everything about it and i think particularly formulating for sensitive skin having that closeness that close connection to the to the to the formulation of it and it's daily manufacture is critical so i think that's a big reason why we kept it in house against all advice so every investor banker financier everybody says so this is more of a financial decision as in their advice they were like get rid of your manufacturing get it out of your business it's going to suck up cash and it has <laughs> and it really has and um I wouldn't change it Mary I would not change it because it's what makes Pi Pi and it's what is having that that connection to the product it means we've got we've got truly unique formulas and it means that we have full visibility of the supply chain behind it which from a good practice and sustainability practice we feel good about because we we can say we're something because we know and yes. we're, we're in control um but it's just it, it is honestly having that we're working with we're working with the most extraordinary botanical ingredients and they some of these ingredients have honestly magical skin properties and we've i think over the years we've sort of lost that connection to the power of and the remedial properties of plants right i've i've seen it i've seen it over 16 years i i see what they can do and it is about protecting those ingredients 
because they can be quite fragile and you want if you're going to go to the expense of sourcing that ingredient you want to make sure that the end the properties are in the product at the end because there's all these steps where you can deplete those properties through overheating or whatever so it, we are just the ultimate control freaks yeah <laughs> Well, but, but it's, it's, what, it's, it's more compromise. It's a no compromise, but it's because we feel it's necessary. Mm. And um, but it's also where it's the bit I love. It's like it's it's where it is where the magic happens, and it is what delivers this unique, unique quality. Mm. Um, and it's always the thing I say I'm most proud of. People saying, oh, you know, is it that award or that? And I'm like, no, no. It's the fact that we've managed to keep it in in house all of this time and scaled, and then we've got bits of a kit in our factory that are individual pieces of equipment that cost a million pounds. You know, or well, it's it's a huge commitment to the cause, and it's insan it's commercial insanity, honestly. Mm-hmm. Like, and and having to persuade investors to say it's necessary, and that's an ongoing fight, you know. And it is, and I'm just. Both my partner and I have just been very belligerent about it. Yeah. <laughs> to say, look, okay, you don't, you know, that's fine. You don't have to subscribe to this, but then you're not on this journey with us. And I'm going to come and, back to that. Yeah, do you know, really by all means, do. By all that's means, a yeah. really interesting part about investors and also keeping true to your core values and what the business is about. Yeah. But for anyone who maybe is at the early stages of <clears throat> starting their skincare brand, yes. anyone who's listening, because that part is really interesting, what you said earlier about, you know, the early days. And it's a really tricky period of time where you are chasing demand but also producing. Yeah. Talk me through that. Um so well, I'll tell you a story. So when we were starting out, I went, basically, I started the business and ran out of money within three months. <laughs> so I'd say I'd had a little bank of savings, little being the operative words. And it's funny, my late dad, he's not with us now, but he always said, when you when you don't have that paycheck, so you're going to really feel it. And I was like, and then there is something when it, actually it's not, the money doesn't automatically flow into your account. And you're like, holy crap, we've got a problem here. And and so the money I thought would last a while ran out very, very quickly because you're trying, you've got to... How buy, quickly? I mean, it was three months, right? Yeah. So, so I had to go back to my job and go, hi, hi, remember me? Could I freelance for you? And they were amazing and so supportive and so sure. So I did some freelance work for them and did a few other freelance projects that, you know just kept bringing in the money while I figured out how to do it. But it, it, it's very difficult because you're trying it, it, lots of packaging. You have to buy, there's a minimum order quantity. And there was one glass bottle that I was determined to get and have, but it came on a pallet and the pallet was two and a half thousand units. I was like, and I was working in a garage, right? A tiny garage. So that pallet took up most of the garage. <laughs> So it was just, and then I just sort of maneuver around this, this. So, yeah, I mean, it was, I look back and I just realize how beautifully green and naive I was, you know, and, it, you know, at the time my, my partner had a sort of different t-shirt business and, and anyway, so we came together and we had these incredibly complementary skills and it was, it, it, that was where things started to unlock really. But yeah, I was just so naive, but, but actually the vision was there and it's never, ever changed. And so I think that's what, you know, got us through the million mistakes we made because there was always this authentic reason that we existed. Well, I didn't choose this. I never chose, I didn't go one day, oh, I'd love to. I'd love to have an organic skincare brand. I've never come from this world. I've never worked in beauty in my life. It shows me. And and they're the best brands, I think, because the, there is an authentic purpose that drives you every day. You're serving a customer that needs help and really needs help. And and I get direct DMs every day telling me, thank you. And it's just a lovely, lovely thing. Um, so anyway, it was going back to your actual question. <laughs> Um, yeah, I, it was difficult, but, and it was very hand to mouth, but, but, um, there was this beauty in creation. You're creating something from nothing, from an idea. Um, and often from a customer need that you're seeing. And, 
I was sort of, I, I've done quite a lot of talks in schools around manufacturing because I think people sort of have this vision of it being, you know, men in greasy overalls and spanners. And it's not, right? There's, it can be many things. And, you, you know, say, you say that because I imagine you in your garage with like, you know, the bicycles. No, I, no, no, it was clear. No, no, it wasn't. No, no, because we had to be, a, it had to be a clean environment. So no, it, for sure. But, but it was, yeah. yeah, but it, no, it was more pipettes and, you know, yeah, yeah. sort of thing. So it was a very, you know, I'd made it into a, make, you know, into a lab, really. I mean, it's, it's, it's nuts, but, um, yeah, I guess it's what it is what drives me is having that kind of curiosity and seeing emerging ingredients particularly that really excites me and I'm like, oh, that looks really interesting and then seeing all the kind of data and science behind it and then um, but talking simultaneously to a customer that and understanding, okay, and, and bringing the two together and then creating something just from an idea and then formulating and we're going through all of the process and it's a really it's 18 months it takes a long time to get a product to market now and then it coming off the, the first bottles coming off the line in your own factory in your own under your own roof there's like nothing like it um and i think we always start when we create a product it, i always sort of say to the team it has to be um either something that doesn't exist the world doesn't need another you know moisturizer serum whatever it is, it has to either not exist or we genuinely believe that we can do it better. Um, and there has to be this underlying customer need. And if you can't tick at least one or more of these boxes, the product doesn't go ahead because otherwise it's sort of just vacuous making. And what I do know about our industry, you know, I love our beauty industry. It's an amazing space to play, but we're, we're creating a lot of excess. And we've got to, so we need to be much more thoughtful in the way we produce. And we're doing a lot of work there around biotech and um, biotechnology and, and looking at how we use upcycled ingredients and zero waste ingredients to just, if we're making a stuff, making it in the most, in the most sustainable and responsible way. And there are ways to do it and it is the future, but I'm not seeing it in the rest of the industry. And that's a whole movement that we need to go after. <clears throat> Going back to those early days. What was that pivotal moment where things changed for you? Where, you know, you were talking about like living hand to mouth. At which point it was like a turning point for the for the brand? Um It's a great question. I think there's a couple that come to mind. There was a moment where so it was a and I can't think what year it would have been actually, but easy to look up. Because so it I remember coming into a new year and at the time there was only about three or four of us in the business and um, it was just one of those lucky breaks. You have lots of ups and downs in business. It's like, and it's, it is, it's so all the ghost, everyone says it, it's true. But I remember coming into a new year and I, it's, I needed to go and have eye surgery, right? So years ago I detached my retina playing netball Oh, wow. I didn't even play netball. I was doing it as a, for a favor mm. for a charity match and got a ball in my head and detached one retina and ripped the other. Oh. Nearly went blind. It's, um, anyway, so I'd had all of the surgery years before, but I had woken up on New Year's Day and gone, I can't see. And they'd always said, if you get these symptoms, it's potentially redetaching, get in as fast as you can. So I rushed to Moorfield's Eye Hospital. They're like, yeah, we need to reattach. We need, we've got to fix some holes. And so I had this very painful, this time lasers, not full physical surgery, but it was an ag absolute agony. And I remember coming home and I'd caught basically swine flu in the hospital. I came home, felt absolutely awful going, is this like the aftershock of what's happened or is, am I really ill? And I was like, no, I'm really, really ill. So I was lying literally on my deathbed going, I can't see, I'm in agony and I'm really, really sick. And I was like, it's okay, Shamarie's back tomorrow. And she was our formulator. So I will tell you this bit, but this amazing serendipitous moment happened early, years earlier where I was like, I really need a, a I need a cosmetic chemist in the business. I've got the products to a basic thing. I've got them tested. I've followed everything, but you know, preservation's a real challenge. And this, this, um, not she wasn't a student. She, but she was an early stage career. A, a cosmetic chemist from L'Oreal said, "I want to work in London. I'm French. I'm working at L'Oreal. 
I'm working on one ingredient or one hair follicle and it's really boring and I really want to work on organic but and I and you're literally if I organic plus London you're the only game in town can I come and work for you and I think she thought we were a fully fledged business she literally arrived off the train and looked at the note around and was like okay what is <laughs> that <laughs> um but it, yeah. she was anyway she'd been off for Christmas I said she's back tomorrow and she called me up and said I, I've got um uh, another virus and I'm out I'm still in Paris I can't get on a train I was like we have no stock we have no stock um, and it was this moment of I think we're going to go under and by weird weird serendipity I got an email pinged into my inbox and said hi could you give me a call I'm calling from LA and just want to talk to you about the award season and I was like what and I called up and they said hi and she talked to me for about 20 minutes about her cut irons and getting everything ready and obviously a big year and and could I get this product shipped and could I do it tomorrow and was it best to get it in the different hotels and I was like and I got to the end of the call and I didn't want to look stupid so I kept going yeah yeah Writing stuff down, <laughs> trying to look for the clues. At the end of the call, I said, "Sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm just gonna have to say it." I said, "What are we talking about here? And who are we talking about?" And she went, "Natalie," and I said, "Natalie who?" And she went, "Natalie Portman. She's your biggest fan." And I went, "Okay, things are looking up." <laughs> <laughs> and that was a defining moment in the business where I suddenly went, "Okay, we're fine," because I was like, "If Natalie Portman's talking about us, we're fine." And um, and that it was Black Swan. And what we'd realised was her Black Swan Academy Award year. And she'd done the whole award season. She was very pregnant at the time. And she did the whole award season. Um, sponsored by Dior, but talking about Pi as her absolute love brand. And that's the thing about brand is that it's always about that love. Finding those, that instilling that love and embedding it. And she just loved the brand. And, it, you know, we had just impeccable natural credentials that she really loved. And... What we, we, we realised is years prior, we'd supplied unwittingly a film set. We knew we had, we, we supplied lots of Hollywood film sets actually, but you never know what they are. And they, we'd had all of these issues with getting stuff through customs and they'd said, just write Black Swan on the box. And we'd forgotten this and we'd gone back to our emails and went, Black, Black Swan. <laughs> and uh, so it's just, and that's where she'd obviously come across the product. And But oh, I had remembered that I'd written to her years prior as well. So I always, I never know what was the moment, whether it was the letter or whether it was that or the combination or whether she'd loved the product and brought it into the set. I don't know. But she was just this mega fan. And, um, you know, it was just amazing, those formative years and put our, our best-selling Moisturizer, the Anthemus, on the mat because it's this beautiful, calming cream and it's great for rosacea and great for sensitivity. But she loved it, um, and that was it. And that moment, because with, particularly in that kind of award season, a lot of the interviews get syndicated. So you'll, she'll do one interview and it will get syndicated everywhere in every consumer magazine. So just pie, 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 and that was it. So that product just took off. Um, so that's one of the kind of moments I think. How did you feel? I'm elated and relieved. Mm -hmm. But I mean, I f you feel that in equal measure all of the time. I've, that's never changed. I feel elated and relieved. How many years? <laughs> how many years was it into the business having started? That mm -hmm. I can't. I couldn't tell you. I mean, I'm trying to think. We have to quickly Google when Black Swan, um, when Natalie won that award. I want to say. Oh, you can Google it. I think it was. <laughs> Must have been eight years ago. Yeah, must have been because she's got no. It might have been ten years ago actually, because I think she's she's gone on to have a second boy as well. Um, I think probably ten years ago. So it was sort of that moment, and then another was when we got our two thousand and ten. Okay, so it was three years into the business. Thirteen years. Oh my god, <laughs> thirteen years ago. So three years into the business. I mean, we were totally bootstrapped, and you know, had never at that point managed to raise any money. I think. I could, we got our first bank loan, which was twenty thousand pounds. I don't know if that come before or after, um, but yeah, I mean, it was that was a sort of unlocking. Another was when we got our first proper listing, which was Whole Foods, um, and that's a funny story because we were doing a lot of trade shows to meet buyers, and we knew that the, the word in the 
in the pavilion was that the, the Whole Foods buyer was in the house, right? So we're like, she's wearing a Mac. And we're like, okay. <laughs> and I remember my partner, Ed, was like, I'm going to find her. You know, it's this huge trade show and he's running around looking for someone in a Mac. <laughs> he brought this person to the stand and I was like, surprising. I'm not, I wouldn't have thought, I wouldn't have imagined her to look like that. I don't know why. And anyway, and I had this noise, sell, 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 sell. <laughs> and then I was like, right, so let me, let's write down your details. And it, it turned out that she ran a tiny little independent store in the Outer Hebrides. Can't make it up. Wasn't the buyer at all. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wrong. And I was like, Ed. <laughs> he was like, okay. And he ran back and he found her and he's brought her to the stand. And that was when we, her name, in, Ines, Ines Hamida. Um, lovely lovely lady who stayed a fr friend and um she gave us that break and but and also whole foods and you know was just they they were a really interesting business to work with because they really and you don't get this often with retailers they really understand the, the importance of that partnership with their suppliers so they did a lot to support us and really told us what we needed to do so i would go into store every weekend and talk to customers and and it built from there. So that was a kind of just having that credibility of a decent listing under our belts. Um, was that was a kind of, kind of another moment. And then then John Lewis and then later Sephora and then these these moments. I think those moments of retail distribution that you land that that kind of take you to the next that give you that platform and the, the eyeballs that take you to the next stage. Mm. So there have been moments in time. You mentioned the story, the sort of sell, sell, sell. What do you think your personal qualities are that got you to where you are now? Gosh, that's a great question. Uh, well, I'm acutely aware of my weaknesses, but I think I um, honestly, I I think it. I think I'm a good communicator, and I think uh, I've honed that skill. And I think I'm. I think I can take quite a complex technical scientific subjects and distill it down to make it really simple for people to understand. So I think I do that well with the consumer, but I think I can do that with opinion forms like press and beauty editors. And so I think that bit I'm good at, but I also think I'm good at communicating the mission to our team. Speaking to you now, I mean, you're a great <laughs> storyteller. Tell a good story. I've had lots of them. I just the stories, too many. Um, we talked about, you know, getting that 20,000 pounds as the sort of the first check. Yeah. And I believe recently you received a significant amount of investment. Yes. Took yep. me through fundraising from early wow. days yeah. to now, because at each stage that's very different. It is. I mean, it's a, it's a really, it's a, it's a great question. I think we, so we started with bank debt. I think that came first and um, it was painful to get and actually it, just, it took so long the irony was is that 20,000 that that point we wanted it to hire to be able to us to hire some support and launch a new product we wanted to launch our eye cream and we needed going back to these minimum order quantities we had this perfect airless pack we needed and it was that was going to cost us 5,000 just to get the packaging in so we that's um so we we knew what we needed it for persuading the bank and we had track record by then um and persuading the bank took so long because it was also think about the timing, sort of that kind of 2009, 2010, was, the economy wasn't brilliant. Um, persuading banks to part with the money um, was painful. And by the time we got it, we were like, Ugh. because the, the amount of time it took us, we're now doing 20,000 a month, you know? And so we don't, you know, it's not very much money now. But anyway, we were still grateful to get it. So it started with bank debt and then we went to angel investors and at that same trade show that I talked about, um, we had um, the whole, where we found the Whole Foods bar. We also were a, a finance broker stepped onto our stand and he, we, we'd sort of set up the meeting and that, it was through our bank, HSBC, who'd been incredibly supportive, said, I just think you should chat to this guy. He might be able to kind of secure you some angel investment. So we invited him to the stand. His name was Richard Fox. He then became our non-exec director and mentor for many years and 
just the most wonderful man and I we owe him so much um, and a true, true friend in the end. But he stepped onto the stand, which was literally the size of a shoebox. It was the most beautiful shoebox. I mean, we'd made it look like a little boudoir and it was impeccable, the presentation, but he stepped on and he saw something and he saw something in the products and he saw something in us. And then he went away and secured us about 80,000 pounds of angel investment with, and he, and we went for, at the time, quite a punchy valuation. And he was like, we'll never get it. And I said, well, we're not going to do it unless we do. And he so believed in us. He said, okay, the only way I'm going to do this is if I invest to show that I believe. And I said, okay, great. And he did. And he didn't, I think he did like five or 10K, but it was the, it was the principle of it that he said, if I do it, they'll follow because they'll know that I wouldn't do it unless I was sure. And those guys made a lot of money from pie later, but they took the punt, right? So we raised that and that was really helpful in just securing premises. You know, we had to scale each time. And then from there, we were then in a much better situation because actually at this point, I mean, I don't know how we did it, but we maintained profitability every single year, despite running a manufacturing business. I mean, it's... And not, did you do that? I don't know how we did it. I think, well, I just, you know what? Maybe our blissful naivety of knowing that actually you just need to sell more than you spend. Right? <laughs> a very basic more cash in than more cash out. And I think we run a really, really tight ship. And it's just a basic discipline that we've fallen out of sometimes. But um, those early years, we just, yeah, we could show that we were profitable and we could see it, show we were growing and we were growing, you know, 30% year on year on year on year. So we we then got some wind in our sails and that then and that enabled us actually to get more bank debt. And that, I'm always amazed and I talk to, to other founders all the time at early stage and I say, don't forget banks. And it's different now. When I started, you know, it was so hard to get bank debt. Um, and now it's very different. And so, and we, we as I say, are a very supportive bank, but we... It enabled us to not sell masses of equity very early. So we had to send a bit to get that kind of lift off. But it just, we could bring in, I mean, we managed to get such as, I don't know, in the region of half a million in bank debt at that point, which we were able to pay off, you know. And, and I don't want to sort of stereotype here, but I think often women can be, the female founders I, I come across often say, I don't want to do, I don't want, I've never taken debt. And I always say, don't be fearful of it. And I, I think, and again, it's a massive stereotype. Guys can be a bit more bullish about it. And actually what Ed, my partner said to me was, he said, you've got to frame it differently. And it's just a cost of doing business. So it's, you, we pay our staff, we pay our lease, you know, we pay, you know, corporation tax, we pay council tax and we pay our debt to the bank. And as soon as, as soon as I framed it in that way, I was like, okay, I'm totally relaxed about so this. Were you, but it's a cost what? of doing business. So before you considered debt is that the mindset that you had about it though it was like scary a little bit yeah. i don't think i i mean i hadn't lost sleep about it and i hadn't really i hadn't i hadn't i definitely hadn't ruled it out at all but i think when you do that first when you first raise quite a lot of debt and you're an early stage business you, there is a nervousness of can i pay this back the, the truth is they will not lend it to you if they don't believe you can like they just won't and they'll have done all of their number crunching so um but i think there was a slight reticence and i think it was you know my partner saying look actually it's much better we do it this way and, and we did and it was absolutely right to do and also we could then do much because we were a manufacturing business we could do a lot more kind of supply finance type debt so that's a different type of loan but it's where you're buying in this expensive packaging that you can't monetize for six months because it's on a huge lead time, it arrives, and you might, it, it might take a year to sell through that glass bottle, right? So you need to monetize it, but you're spending it. You're having to pay for all of it up front. So they will do that. So they'll give you that six-month buffer. So they'll pay it, and then you've got that time to monetize it. And that's really helpful debt. And, and the, you know, a factory can't run without that type of debt. So... So then we went to the debt and, and that was really helpful. And then we did our first Series A, which was with a family office in France. Um, and life could turn on his eye. And I think we were just, we, we were courting a lot of the traditional private equity. They didn't love the fact that we had a factory and they didn't really want their money going there. And, and then we, we had a lot of interested parties, but we just, we just weren't sure. 
and we weren't sure whether we'd lose a lot of autonomy. Anyway, so, and then just in the last, we were trying to close the round and we had sort of two weeks to go and I was chatting to a store in France called Aimway Cream, which was another, actually that was a moment where, that was the defining moment of unlocking growth actually. We'll talk about that in a minute, but um, that founder has again been a great partner to us and partner to me as well and a good friend to me. And she'd sort of said, oh, we're here, you know, you're raising money. And I said, yeah, we're trying. And she said, you really should speak to Thomas. And it was uh, this early stage and this investor that had invested in her and her business in the early stages. And that's a retailer and she's now got 30 stores, but, um, and worth a chat. And so we went and he said, no, this is, and the beauty of it was that we were listed in that store and we were top three brand. So we came with the credibility of Juliet, the founder saying, this brand is beautiful and it is doing so well. It's a, like a really good bet, right? So we had that really helping us. And we went and said, look, we we're about to close this round and you're gonna have to get in quick if you're interested. And he did, and he said, okay, let's do it. And then we had an offer within about a week. And then I said, okay. And, and he said, we're gonna do very light touch due diligence. And it was, I mean, having done due diligence a lot since, it was really light touch due diligence. We'd done it in about a fortnight and then we we're away. And that was, I think, a raise of, I'm gonna get the numbers wrong, but it was about 2 million, I wanna say, that time, maybe a bit less. Um, but with the offer of, of more later and, but it was up to a kind of threshold of three or four. I mean, that's their kind of, they're a, they're a smaller investor, but a family business. And I think that was really, it's just a lovely, lovely family. And always said to us that we're different to kind of typical private equity, which is that we kind of, we're not in a race. We just want somewhere safe for our money that's going to, you know, grow and, um, you know, we're a 150 year old printing business, you know, we've been, <laughs> been, around, you know, we've been around and we know that long, you know, long isn't bad and, and that's fine. And so, but that was a huge leg up. Um, and then subsequent to that, they then introduced us. They said, look, we think you need a lot more money. And they were right. And we were heading in, this was pre COVID so that we sort of took the decision. And they, they said, and we don't do that kind of size of raise. And they helped us with that next stage raise and then introduced us to another family office, which was the Clarence family, um, both being French. And um, and that was the start of a much more meaningful relationship. We've done two now raises with them. So you know, big money again. So yeah. <laughs> what was that like, the, the, the last stage? Very hard. Um, I think all, I mean, I spent a lot, you know, my, partner and I laugh because we spent a lot of the last few years raising money and um, it takes you out of the business. And that's that's the biggest tragedy because that's, you know, it robs, it, the business has robbed of your attention. I would say it was the first, and the first raise was, was challenging in a different way because it was COVID. And so COVID had just happened. And I mean, you can imagine we had no idea what was gonna happen um we're in the middle of a fundraise we were trying to keep a factory open we had no idea if any of our retailers were going to pay us what they owed us because you just didn't know we didn't know who to follow or who to keep in the business um we decided ridiculously that we needed to do our bit for humanity and started making sanitizer to give away so and that grew arms and legs and whole bodies and I mean, I'm, it's the proudest thing, really. I'm so proud of what we did, and we gave, we donated twenty four thousand units of hand sanitizer. But that was that bought its that was its own work stream, and then we had two little ones. So we had two kids who, at the time, were three and six, mm -hmm. and so and we're at home, and you know, there were we were working every waking second and also trying to keep a, a team calm and feeling secure and that and yeah um looked after and being the voice of strength and reason and and um safety at a very scary time for a lot of them so it was i'll never forget that time and 
I remember my children going, Mummy, I'm really hungry. Can we have some lunch? And I'd look at my watch, it'd be three o'clock, and I'd literally pick up a bag of crisps and just throw bags of hula hoops. That's eat that, that's you know, that's your lunch. Yeah. And I look back and I just, and they really, I don't know that they suffered because they didn't know any better, but they were wonderful. And, but just, yeah, and one that was at school, so we're trying to get them on calls. And, Sometimes you've got to do what you've got to do. Well, we just concluded that they we would catch them up later and that we just, we needed to keep uh, our business going. And I think that was the scariest thing for any smaller business that at that time was, we, this is our whole livelihood. This is, we've worked, we've put, we poured every, everything into this and we might lose it. And that was a really scary, scary moment. And there was no training manual of what to do. Um, but actually we grew that year. The irony. <laughs> Brexit nearly killed us, but we grew, we grew that year. And there's so many. The subsequent, yeah. So that was really interesting. But so, so that was the first race. It was difficult, not because of the investment round, but it was difficult because of everything that was going on. And we never met. We'd never met. So we met our future investors. We'd never physically met in person. It's amazing what you can do when you have some restrictions like that, where you think, oh, well, you can't do business with anyone if you haven't sort of sat down with them, but you can. Do you know what? I think I look back at that time and as hard as it was, I think it it was, it brought its own moments actually. And I think what it taught us, and you know, Ed and I've said this so many times to our team, it showed us what we could do when we really put our minds to something. You know, we, we decided on this project that we were going to do. And, um, you know, I remember Ed had, had heard Matthew Paris on the radio talking about, you know, it was just all happening. And he said, we need to have a good war with this virus. We need to, we need, there needs to be a coming together and we all need to contribute. And he came to me and he said, we've got to do our bit. And I said, well, what does that look like? And, he, and it, this was late February, I think, early March. And he said, I think, and we could see that everyone was so ill-equipped. And he said, we've got a factory and we're probably going to have to send all of many people home. So let's turn it over to making sanitizer. And I said, but we've never made sanitizer. In fact, we don't have a drop of alcohol in our building because we don't believe in it. <laughs> in the irony, we don't believe in alcohol in the skin. And he said, yeah, but I think we should do it. And it was he was absolutely right. And it was that conviction. He's, he's, that's very much him. And he's very inspiring like that. But he said to the team, you've got two weeks. I'm giving you two weeks. And the team, being, you know, classic, it's impossible, it's impossible. And he said, well, now you've only got one week. <laughs> <laughs> and we did it. And, I, you know, I take my hat off to the team. We just, we just all dug in. And I'm so proud of them because we, it was just, it showed what, like, when you, you can do amazing things when you just come together and you believe, right? And so we were calling up Sipsmith Distillery, which is like, have you got any alcohol? And and um, because there was just nothing, Every, you know, there was and the idea of a sanitizer. I mean, people were vaguely aware of them, but of course the ones that were there were sold out in about a day. And so we went and created it. And then all of the other ingredients, like emulsifiers that hold the not available with no packaging so we just found packaging that we'd not used and just labeled it i mean it looked terrible but no one cared right and we started making it and sky came to film us saying this is amazing we were like yeah and ed would go out every morning on his bike and he dropped them on elderly residents doorsteps Aww. and he took them into supermarkets and gave handed them out to the checkout staff who were like pathetically grateful going we have nothing Aww. and tube workers and we did all the people that you wouldn't think about that we kind of that were on the front lines and the tube workers and then we had you know we set up this email address saying that anyone that's in need just tell us and we just had thousands of things and every story made us cry like there were gr local groups doing um that were autism that, that working with autistic children that you know with severe autism they're like we have to support these kids and we're like you got them we're sending someone and the, but we, there was just these stories every day and, and the team were like and the team actually i don't blame them at all they shut the, they shut the email off and said we can't because we can't do it and it's not fair and i said no we have to do every one and they were like but how are we going to do it and i was like also how are we going to pay for it so we were like what do we do what do we do so we decided we'd start this thing where we would um share so we get so the every every sanitizer that a customer bought we would donate one and that was how we fund it so basically it would be cost neutral but it wouldn't literally plunge the 
business into <laughs> bankruptcy because also at the time we were like, what if, what if no one pays us? So, um, but we couldn't lay our hands on the equipment. And then our head of operations, director of ops, came and said, Sarah, you, don't, you know that we can't run alcohol through our machines. I went, what? He said, we'll have to manually make this. So I was like, so we manually made it, manually filled it, manually labeled it, and donated a lot. And um, but we but we had this mechanism then, and then and then everyone copied it, and it was great. I was like, the more the merrier, you know. But we were the first to do it, and it was a really, really proud moment. And we called it Acton Spirit yeah. because we were in Acton, our factory was in Acton, and it was obviously spirit alcohol. But it was a tribute to the, this point that when we got here was about what happened in that moment of a sharing what you can do when you put your mind to it and this coming together and it was this it was a kind of nod to the community aspect of collective effort and and what extraordinary collective endeavor can do it made, it, really made me, it made me do you know what um it's it's rare that when i talk talk about this i don't cry yeah. and we've got a, 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 about a year later, we were the Sunday Times gave us an award, and we just—I well, mean, we totally didn't expect it. We didn't know that people knew about it, um, and we got this lovely award to say thanks. And we just, yeah, yeah, it is. It's a really lovely thing. That's amazing. That time was hard. It was. And you're saying you're having to you know, keep your business afloat, keep your team motivated you know, trying to use your resources and your know-how to contribute to like global panic and you know, people were terrified, mm. you know, especially for like older people, not only their health is at risk, but not being able to like see relatives. It was a difficult time. To be able to, you know, roll your sleeves up and, and do that regardless of the mm. fact that you yourself having to survive and like but, weather the storms. But there is... I saw it, we saw it everywhere. I think in people doing it in diff their different ways, you know, and it doesn't matter how small or how big, actually. I think that's the point is that we saw it in our own community. We saw it every day. And that we've got, you know, we're very lucky. We live in a, actually a street of lovely, lovely people who, and I'm sure, I think probably many people had this. Um, I hope so. But just these, these little acts of kindness were happening everywhere. Um, and I also think just even just from a business perspective and a brand perspective, I thought what was really interesting at that time was that people then really started to think about how they spent their money. So I'm not thinking about, I'm not talking about restricting it. It was about they wanted to buy responsibly and, and in a really considered way. And so people were making very considered purchases. Not always, obviously sometimes they just wanted their their onesies and their <laughs> and their sadder ingredients, but um, but I think I think that we certainly heard that a lot. Was that and I I was like that. I was like I I want I want to vote with my wallet. You know that slight cliched expression, but it, what we we saw that a lot. Um, and I think that paid back for us. We were doing something good, but I think it wasn't that we were selling this. We sold we sold some, but we sold a fraction of what we donated. But I think people valued that and then it was great for the brand in many ways and, and sort of got us awareness that we weren't, that wasn't the point of the exercise, but I think we were rewarded. Mm. I think you, you're, you're not really taking enough credit for that because there were some stores in this area that at the time of the toilet paper mm. shortage have hiked up the prices to ridiculous amounts. Mm. And at one point we were like, we're going to have to boycott this place because this is no way to deal with it where you're profiting off of people's misery. Yeah. Well, I think we're seeing that now as well. So I, th I think, um, you know, inflation's coming down, prices aren't. And I think that's wrong. And actually when, it, so I'm trying to think, well now, it, a year ago, well more than a year ago, we were talking about going into 23 and whether we were gonna put pricing up. And, and you know what, we should have, um, but we didn't. Because I said, this isn't a time to ask the customer to pay more. And, and even though our costs are going up, we will absorb what we can. At some point, we'll have to do it. But let's hold off until we have to. And we, we came in for a lot of criticism for it, you know, for for not seizing this opportunity. And actually, people have talked to us after this. And we're, we're looking at pricing analysis now. And the, the analyst said, well, you missed your moment. You could have really hiked up your price. And we're like, yeah, but that wasn't the point. And, I, you know, you don't. 
at some point you've got to have the moral compass in your company to say no we're not going to inflict that on the on our customer when they're already suffering and so we were and we've been told since from all of our retailers we were the only beauty brand this year that didn't put their prices up and most put their prices up by a minimum of 10 percent and we're like okay were we commercially insane or <laughs> but we feel good about that because actually to your point about the toilet paper that's just not ethical practice and actually you've probably never felt the same about that that corner shop since right that independent store you you you've probably boycotted them for longer yes um so uh, i always say this about generally about leadership i think you have to be you've got to be able to take the right decisions not just the easy ones right and that's that's leadership and i think and that's also what authentic and ethical brands do they take the good decisions even when they're commercially impractical because it's the right thing to do and selfishly i want to sleep at night but um it is about that it, it that's what we need we need more businesses thinking like this rather than just um fairly ruthlessly seizing an opportunity and hurting the customer because they've got enough to contend with mm. so i i think what you saw in covid we're still seeing now i think there was a moment i'm not i'm and to be really clear and there's a balance there is a real balance here because i'm not going to pretend that for a lot of businesses those inflationary heights have been brutal on their cost of goods right and not, and not there is a balance here and of course there have been need some businesses the lower margin products that you have to to survive right um and uh a friend of mine works works for McVitie's actually and she was saying the McVitie's the McVitie's digestive you know because so much of the ingredients come from Ukraine right there is like you know and they had the cost of living they were like but they weren't allowed to put the price up by supermarkets because it was you know a staple product so you know there's been there are pressures and there is there is a balance but I think there's taking advantage what did you learn about yourself during that time that surprised you um I resilience I guess I think I had no but you know with my partner we had to dig so deep day after day after day after day after day after day and then you know we'd had a lot of practice you know and it, I always remember because a lot of people were working at home with their husbands for the first time. <laughs> I mean, Hello, this is interesting. <laughs> yeah, also this is quite a strain, and I, and we're like it's not very different for us. You know, we're well versed in this. So, I think resilience because it was you know you, they, you had to you just needed these inner reserves of energy, and actually I also I just had to put on a very um, maybe my acting skills too because I you had you had to put on this incredibly strong front. Even when you were like, oh, I don't know what's going to happen. It's going to be great, everyone. It's going to be fine, and we're going to be great, and we're doing this good thing here, and you should all feel really proud of that. And you know, but it was doing that every day, and it's exhausting when you don't necessarily, you know, you're not necessarily feeling it every day. I think that resilience was certainly um, a big. A, and this a, is to your team. This is to the team. Yeah, yeah, to the team. And um, so that resilience, for sure. Um, I think both Ed and I really interesting. We I think we're natural problem solvers. I think Ed particularly is like the big thinker, and he is an incredible person to have in a crisis. And that this was a crisis, and he was just like. And so I think it it, it kind of I we both sort of elevated with it. Um, I think yeah, problem solving capabilities literally came to the fore because you know at one point we had thirteen different formulas of this bloody sanitizer because we could and we were just like iterate 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 um but i think going back to that because actually what came out of that just that initiative was something else because we and we'd always wanted to do this thing called pi labs where it's just our innovation hub where we're looking at ingredients and and moving very fast in the market and moving with leveraging the fact we've got a lab and a factory we weren't really leveraging that and saying okay we can we should be um yeah, just much more agile. And I think that moment forced us to, and we were like, look what we can do in two weeks. So none of this, we can't make a product in less than 18 months. We can, 
I'm not saying we always should, but there are moments and we started this whole um, concept called labs where, which has been much copied actually since, but it, this, this where we were just moving with the market and the customer and just getting stuff out and testing and earning and saying, tell us if you like it. And we created this whole kind of actives range, which are little boosters. Um, really affordable. You put a drop in your moisturizer, great for sensitive skin that you can, you're in control again. And it, but it spawned out of that. So I think, what did I learn? I learned that you can do anything. I also learned that you can't do everything. You can do anything, but not everything. And I come back to that, that sentiment all the time. I have to remind myself I, I'm a natural doer and I get sucked into the weed all of the time and I allow myself to do it and you can't do everything. And I learned that too in COVID. I tried to do everything and I nearly was very burnt out. Mm. But you can do anything. And and that was a really good reminder of that. I'm a huge believer in that. And as I'm getting older, I'm beginning to see that that's the case as well. Because there's only so many things that you can do well yeah. at the same time. Yeah. Like not even talking about having kids, but like projects within your business or extra things that you're doing. What structures did you put in place or kind of what gets you out of the weeds when you realize like, hold on a second, maybe I'm overdoing something here or does it not even happen anymore? Oh, it definitely happens. I think if you're that way inclined, it's really hard to, and I think, I think it's my greatest weakness actually. I think I can, and it goes back to that problem solving. If I see any, if I see that a customer's not We've got a problem in the businesses that that's going to be, be impacting the customer experience. I I am I can't stand it. And if I see any procrastination in getting it sorted out, I literally can't stand it. And I will be like, okay, I'll do it. You know, mm -hmm. it's terrible. It's not good for the team. It's not good for you. It's not good for your workload. It's not. And you stop people being accountable for their own work. You know, that's not. It's not helpful for their development. So that I have to really kind of restrain myself to go no. Let them, let them do their jobs. You, you, yeah. you say something about being your greatest weakness. I'll come back to what I think about it, but you know, mm -hmm. saying that it's what if you're this way inclined, it's very hard not to be that way. How do you stay focused? I think we've got much better as a business at setting strategic pillars at the beginning of the year, right? So we went into this year with three pillars. It's very corporate and it sounds very cliche, but actually that structure of we're going to do this and this and this, and we're not going to do anything else. It makes it very easy then. It's like it should be your kind of North Star and all of that, where you go, okay, does it speak to any of these three pillars? And if it doesn't, you just don't do it. So I think that it gives you the sort of, um, gives you the discipline and the constraints then that forces you to be like that. If you're naturally someone who just sees opportunity everywhere, and I think both my partner and I are both like that, the opportunities everywhere, and and the entrepreneur in you wants to just go after all of it. I think it forces you. So that's it's just very simple structures that helps. Um, I I just also surrounding yourself with people that will bring who will make you do that. So good good mentors. I always remember our one of our early bank managers. Um, you know he loved the brand. He really believed. You know he believed, and he became very invested. Not personal not financially but very invested in the brand and like he'd come to meetings and i'd say and james we've got this opportunity in in you know in india we've got this in this amazing pharmacy chain in new zealand and we've got this little store in the bahamas wants us and they don't bother and i and i just reel off all of these opportunities and he'd say that's that's great so that's so great so which nine of those ten are you going to turn down <laughs> <laughs> and i was like what is that you can do one of the realistically well. And I think that was very early training to go, okay. So I, uh, um, I, I just, I've just had to train myself. I don't know what pulls me out of it. I guess it's having that structure. I guess it's knowing that you've not got, you've got finite money. And um, I think the beauty industry, I mean, we talked about this earlier, but the beauty industry has changed so much. Um, it's become much more saturated. The number of new entrants into the market is extraordinary so it's very it's very expensive to grow a brand now in our in our industry and so you can't spend everywhere you just can't because you won't have any impact 
doing a bit of money here in this market, in this, you know, to this customer targeting this, you can't do all of it. So you actually have to become very single minded and okay, we're, we're going to speak to this customer and we're going to focus on this market and we're going to focus on these retailers and we're just going to have to, you know, keep, keep toe holds here, but just, so I think the financial aspect helped because we've, we've, we've run out of money many times. <laughs> we've had to go, oh my God. And so it, that's really stressful. So I think actually the discipline about how we spend mm -hmm. forces you to focus on the big bets. So I think I am, I am, I'm hard on myself, but I think we are getting better at that. I'm we're way better. And I think you're definitely being hard on yourself because my belief is that every strength is a, is a weakness and vice versa. So every weakness has its plus side. 100%. Because it's it's not just about how you frame it, but it is really, you know, you having to think about, you know, 20 different ideas, you know, this is great, this is great, and this is what the customer is going to love. And, you know, having all these fantastic ideas. No, you can't do them all, but the fact that you have 10 or 20, you have so many more to choose from rather than just the one. Yeah. and. When it comes to having other people around you, having great people that compliment you that are different, yeah. who can say, you know what, all that's great, but let's put a little bit more structure around that yes. and focus. Yeah. And I think that makes a difference. So it's it's recognizing that your strength can be your greatest downfall. Oh, I completely agree. And your that. weakness is your biggest strength. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's so true. I think there's always two sides to a coin. Mm. And I see it, I see it in, I see it in other people too. Well, I can talk to you for ages. <laughs> like Honestly, I, I just feel like the more I ask you questions, the more depth you go to in terms of not just, you know, your business. And many tangents. Your process. <laughs> Actually, not really, but I, I think it's, it's really interesting how your mind works about why you do the things you do, how you approach business, how you approach customer, how you approach sort of investors. I think it's, for me, I just find that fascinating. Mm. But um, but the most important question of all, <laughs> <laughs> what is your skincare routine? Okay, so it's it, it changes actually. I mean, I have cool things. I would say to anybody, start with, everything starts with good cleansing. So I'm a good cleanser and I have worked with so many people with sensitized skin or just difficult skin, misbehaving skin. And I will tell you nine times out of 10, we fix their skin through better cleansing. It's really interesting. If you're using a pore cleanser that is stripping, you know, we talked about it briefly earlier, but if you're stripping your skin, your skin's imbalanced, it's either overproducing oil and you'll get breakouts or it's underproducing oil because you've taken it all away and it's struggling to replace. So really good cleansing with products that keep, that support the skin's natural processes and keep the skin supple and soft and, and you know, it's efficient, but it's not stripping. The single most important thing you can do in skincare and you will age well if you are cleansing gently, efficiently, but gently. And the number one rule is if your skin feels like this, that tightness after cleansing, it is the wrong cleanser. Your skin should feel soft and supple and you shouldn't feel like you need to immediately reach for moisturizer. It's the my classic litmus test. So cleansing, very important. Um, I use our cream cleanser uh, and I sometimes double cleanse with an oil cleanser as well. It depends. And I use those two cleansers interchangeably and they are, um, gorgeous products. I think we're brilliant at cleanse cleansers. Um, and, um, it was the thing that got my skin back into balance very quickly. And so I learned it from very passionate experience that this was very important to get right. So that's cleansing. Um, I love misting. So I'm going to, one of the products I'm going to be sending you Rhea, is very misting. <laughs> so it's a mist mm -hmm. and it's like electrolytes for the skin, but it's lots of hyaluronic acid in there, but it is just, for me at my age, I mean, I'm closer to 50 now than 45, sadly, <laughs> but I will mist with abandon and I've done it for about 10 years. And it's sort of, I think it's becoming a bit of a trend now, but you, I miss between steps, particularly this time of year. So we're in autumn time, getting into winter you layer that hydration in twin steps and it's very important for an oil. And I always finish my routine 
at the end in the evening with a boil. So I don't have a, I don't have multiple multiple steps, but I would I try and keep it quite simple. But I will just layer at when it's when it's um, central heating goes on. So that's misting. Serums are very good. They're very very light t texture and they will absorb deeper. Um, and I would say SPF of course. Protect your skin from the sun every day. Yes, you should use SPF every day. And the, I guess, I don't know the age of the person that's listening to this. I'm sure it's varied, but I would say once you're over the age of maybe 30, certainly 40, certainly over 40, you peptides are your friend. You peptides uh, are your friend. Mm -hmm. And I would say it's the one ingredient that has had the single biggest impact on keeping my skin looking amazing. Um, plumped and happy and moisturized and looking dewy and nice. Um, peptides do this, we don't really understand how they work. And we are using some of the world's first ever truly natural peptides. They always said you'll never get a natural peptide that will work as well as a synthetic one not true and ours work as well as or better than synthetic versions um and these peptides are coming from biotechnology sources so that means that it's green chemistry but it's like the porridge bowl that keeps on giving so they're the most sustainable they're naturally derived but they just they're through fermentation processes so it's the most sustainable way to produce ingredients it is the future um so tick sustainable tick um age support benefits but what they do is they they talk to your skin. They, products can only penetrate so deeply, right? So this idea that you just fill your collagen reserves by just pouring it all in, it doesn't work like that. But what peptides do is they, they send messages to the receptors in your skin cells to tell your skin cells to produce more collagen. So they stimulate collagen production. Fascinating. It's unbelievable. Mm -hmm. And they work. So um, peptides are amazing. Uh, we have a little peptide booster that you can just add into your existing products mm -hmm. um, very um, affordably and easily. Um, so that would be, a, a, yeah, probably the one I would say is amazing. Any brands we shouldn't use? I would never brand bash. <laughs> I, I would, would never say do that. that. I would never do that. <laughs> no, because I would hate to be on the receiving end of that. So no, there's not, I wouldn't say this, this product, I wouldn't say there's brands you shouldn't use. I don't think that's my place, but I would say this is certain ingredients you might want to avoid. And we talked about yeah. some of them earlier. And I would always just say that actually I could line up a hundred people with sensitive skin and, or let's say eczema and every single one of them, I might treat differently. And there's no hard and fast rules. I think everyone's skin is different and only you know your skin. So I think listen to your skin. Um, if you react to a product, it doesn't mean your skin is purging or it, you know, no pain, no gain. It, no, stop using that product. Even if it's a pie product and you're, it, it does, it's not, your skin is not happy. Stop that product. It's not right for you. Um, yeah, I would just say, stop using a product that's, that's causing any irritation or any prickle or anything like that. If you get that telltale prickle, mm. it's not the right product. Stop. And because also... Um, every time your skin is inflamed, it's aging. You know, we call it inflammaging because your skin, you're having a weakened barrier, all sorts of things are happening. So you want to keep your skin, keeping your skin very calm and happy is a very helpful way to age well. Um, there was something else I was going to say about, yes, and sleep. Because we were talking earlier about, um, what happens when you go to sleep and all of your organs go into rest except your skin, which goes berserk. Um, and actually what, one of the core cool things your skin does when it's sleeping, it's not just repairing, it's producing your collagen and your hyaluronic acid. So we have natural hyaluronic acid in our skin. That's the thing that holds moisture in our skin um, and peptides we've talked about, collagen we've talked about. Um, so you want your skin to do its own job as well. So. Products should support the processes, not suppress them, and you should they should work hand in hand. But you don't you want good sleep so that um, your skin is doing its own job. And actually, that's, that's the the real challenge with menopause as people head into perimenopause and then menopause is that sleep is often affected. And we're a very stressed out world, and people are not sleeping well. 
and the statistics are horrifying and there's all sorts of reasons we need sleep for our own mental well-being as well but from a skin pure skin point of view um and this again particularly if you have a skin condition um your skin needs sleep i mean sleep is such a hard thing in our current world high stress very intense mm. you know very little time you yeah. come home you have your dinner quickly mm. and then you know like okay i only have like an hour or whatever to to myself yeah and the whole idea of sleep procrastination mm. and you have to change your lifestyle considerably to be able to get those hours in i have found you do and i think you have to get your you have to get, you have to tell your body and get ready for sleep too. And that's you going back to our cleansers. I think that's one of the ways we conceived them was that it, yes, they have to be efficient and to do all the right things and be gentle and, but, but we made them really sensorial products very, very intentionally. For me, that moment, get the kids to bears, you know, I've had a manic day. It's the bookend to my day and it's my three minutes of me time. And it signals to my brain, okay, you're going to go to sleep soon. And it is, I don't know, very psychologically important so that you're 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 getting to sleep. And um, yeah, it, these things it's are the actually rituals. these things are really it's the rituals, and these things are actually really important. Um, and I know from my own personal experience how I got through to little ones. I don't know because I was somebody who always valued sleep and then got none. Um, and I'm now somewhere between the two. I'm blessed with two good sleepers, thank God. But um, the difference between me as a, as, a, as a person and as a business person on a good sleep day versus a bad sleep day is huge, absolutely huge. I've, I am really poor at decision making. My judgment is not great when I've not had sleep, but when I've had a good night's sleep, I can take on the world. I feel like I can take on the world. And it's it, like it's, it's night and day literally the difference i get angry yeah i get ratchety and mother. very very yeah, ratty so do very I. snappy can't regulate my emotions yeah you know, <laughs> everything bothers me yeah like, well, i'm a yeah, night round the kids i shout at the kids yeah that's not not good for anyone but yeah um i think that's the same for mm. us isn't it one thing you said i don't think we when we were talking just before we started and talking about the skin obviously being the largest organ but it's connection to the gut Yes, so I really struggled and fought to get um, patch testing for my GP, but I would always say to somebody, just just go and check if the sensitivities. Um, well, you know, food is your fuel, and you're fueling an organ, so it it sort of makes sense. But equally, if there's this food groups that you're potentially slightly allergic to or sensitive to. You kind of need to know that. And actually, it's good to know. And I, we do it, we talk about it a lot with children and eczema, actually, because what we see a lot is, well, in children and adults, they'll say, okay, I'm just, it's dairy. I'm going to just exclude dairy. And we have to say that actually never exclude a, a food group from a child because you have no idea the impact of that. It's probably going to be completely needless as well. So you could go through the pain of going through it. And then reintroducing that food group can be really problematic. And that's when allergies can start. So actually, I would always say never, particularly with children with eczema, get, get nutritionist input on that and do it in a guided way because often it's not even necessary anyway. Mm -hmm. and, and again, with adults, I'd say that stop, stop excluding food unless you needlessly, unless you know. And that's where the food diary can come become quite helpful because you can sort of start to see some pointers and go, okay, maybe I'll go and get, I'll get invest in some testing on that. I was thinking almost like rather than sort of gut to skin, I was always thinking like what goes onto your skin also impacts your gut. Is that a thing? No, not really. No, not in the same way. Mm. No. But we see, for example, like this is a really interesting time of year and, and going back to Hong Foods when that's one of our first ever listings and I would be in that. I would be in store every weekend talking to customers. And honestly, I could time it to, uh, you know, to the, the clocks, you know, hitting 12. People would come and, and start to show me eczema on their bodies in store. And they'd, I'd get talking, they'd, go, and they'd roll up a sleeve or roll up a trouser leg and I'd like, show me their yeah, rashes, yeah, right? Like no, no, but, no, but they would say, I, but this is just, no, but I'd start talking, they'd go, well, it's really interesting you say this because I've just got this. And it was always October. 
And I was like, this is really weird, right? And it's, this is, it, there's too many, it's happened too many times for it to be coincidence. And that happened year, and then it happened year on year. And um, I was like, what is it? What is it? And I started to ask people this really interesting question. I'd say, what are you having for breakfast? And people go, what's that got to do with it? And I said, bear with me, what are you having for breakfast? Porridge, porridge. Porridge, 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 porridge. And people, I'm not saying porridge is great. I mean, it's very nutritious, great for kids, great for us. Um, but if you if you have certain skin issues, we just saw this weird connection. And I think it was the combination of dairy, you know, porridge made with dairy. So it was the high dairy with oats, which are very acidic in the gut, which we don't think, we don't think of. And we, it was just tipping the, I don't know whether it was just, I'm not a nutritionist, so mm-hmm. I might, Nutritionists might sort of say this is total nonsense. It might be. This is just what I, anecdotally I observed, and I don't know whether it was just this tipping of acid to alkaline in the diet, which can, in my case, can be very powerful. I need a more alkaline diet, but um, it was just. I think it was just this tipping point, and then they would. They're prone to eczema anyway. They would then flare up, possibly compounded with central heating going on, and and and. But we just saw again and again and again. So All that's an example, but actually lots of foods do you go and you do acidity in the gut. Um, yeah, things like fatty acids, I always say, often say omega-3 can be a really helpful supplement for skin. Those fatty acids are really good, build, kind of building blocks for healthy skin. So yeah, there is de- I mean, definitely we've seen that for years, connections. Mm, fascinating. Yep. Mm. What's next for pie skincare? Well, um, global domination uh no i mean we just want i don't know we just want more more customers to know about us so we know that when people find pie they love pie and it's this true brand love and we're really helping people and i'm not I, that can sound very um conceited but i know we are because they tell us every day and it's that's a real privilege and it's a joy and it's it's it going it just rev, it kind of flows back to how I started the business the, the kind of very unhappy place I was in and I see it in other people all the time so I think we just want to reach more people I think the the brand love is huge it's just we're just not reaching enough people so growing brand awareness is key for us in the next year or two um, we. The, the product innovation continues in earnest and we have a really fun product coming out next year for summer we're really excited about and we have one really hardworking product I can't talk about yet that is a real problem solver for a very specific skin frustration that we get asked about all the time. We get, it's probably the thing we, we get asked about most that we've never really had a, a real solution for and again this product's so scientific it's incredible so just that that continued joy of creating um but creating for purpose mm. beautiful sarah thank you so much oh thank you such thank a pleasure to have you so and to get to know you and yeah. amazing story thank you thank you you've been listening to anatomy of a leader podcast I'm your host, Maria Vorostovsky. If you haven't already, please follow and subscribe this podcast and I'll see you in the next episode.